it's always a Subaru. Have you noticed it's always a Subaru? A, if you're a out Subaru driving, the car? If, it's always a Subaru. If you're out driving, there's somebody driving slow in the left lane. It's a Subaru. If, if you've got somebody, <laughs> you got somebody making a right hand turn from the left hand lane. Look for the six stars. It's a Subaru. If you got somebody <laughs> who's pulled up to a red light, signaling for a right hand turn at a red light, their first one at the intersection, there's nobody coming the other way and they're not turning. It's a Subaru. It's always a Subaru. And I'm trying to figure out what has happened. Every time I'm in traffic and there's somebody, somebody can't figure out how to parallel park. Subaru. It's always a Subaru. Brad, I will tell you this right now. Uh, not, uh, not, uh, not, not having been cut off by a Subaru driver anytime recently. I will say this: not everybody in life, Brad, can be cool. Some people, <laughs> some people have to be Subaru drivers. Okay. Not, so, uh, <laughs> are you oh. are you punching down by making fun of Subaru drivers? I, I, I don't. I, I honestly don't know. I. I started noticing it, and I don't know whether I, I'm literally in this space right now that I don't know whether I've noticed something that really happens or whether it's cognitive bias, and I just noticed it, and now I I, I always notice it when it's a Subaru, and if yeah. it's like a Mazda, I don't pay attention, but but for some reason, <laughs> Subaru drivers are just vexing me. It's kind of like, uh, I don't know, let's say you just bought a white Honda Civic, and then as you're driving yeah. around, you see a bunch of white Honda Civics, and you're all waving and honking each other like, yeah, yeah I also have a white Honda Civic. Uh, now that you've been cut off once or twice by a Subaru, you're like, dang it, yeah. I'm, I'm seeing them everywhere. <laughs> and the worst thing is my wife wants to buy a Subaru, and I'm, I'm dead set against it. She says, but Brad, they're, they're the safest cars on the road. And I say, yeah, they have to be. Their drivers are horrible. <laughs> and on that note, I'm going to say hello, everybody, and welcome to Comic Lab, the show about making comics. And making a living from comics and making some enemies from Subaru <laughs> yeah, exactly. evidently. I'm Brad Geiger, the editor of webcomics.com and the creator of Evil Inc. And I am his pal Dave Kellett, cartoonist of Drive and Sheldon and driver of a Subaru. <laughs> you better not be. And this <laughs> week's hour of comics advice is made possible by your support at patreon.com slash comic lab. So Dave, Dave. Let's talk comics. Let's talk comics, my friend. We have a really good show for today. Uh, Brad and I were chatting about the topics uh, a couple minutes ago, and we're excited for this one. Uh, I will say that this show is going out live to our Patreon members over at the Live Gab level at patreon.com slash comic lab. You can join and watch the show streaming live. Watch Brad's beautiful face. Be oh, look at that face. Oh, Beatific. Oh. Be a tiffic. Be a tiffic. I would say, like, like the way Tidian would draw a face. Am I right? <laughs> All right. So uh, you can join us over at the, uh, the live gab level for ten dollars, <laughs> and the shows are archived. So if you miss the the live pay, uh, <laughs> the live painting, I said. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. Number one, number one. I I think it's pronounced Titian. No, nope, it's Titian, Brad. It's Titian. <laughs> all, all you needed was was one a uh, uh, blue reference, and now you're flubbing all over. <laughs> you can. My heart rate immediately went up, and I'm flush. All the blood went to my cheeks, and my brain is like, "Wait, choking! I need oxygen." Um, anyway, I have to say though that since our uh, uh, right out of the gate shot against Subaru, we've had three people drop out of the oh, live no. room, Brad, where they just they just <laughs> we, left. We, we're heading, losing them like flies. Immediately heading down to trade in their Subaru, I'm assuming. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, or either that or they just hung up so they could go back to driving. I, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I will also say a huge shout out and a thank you to our sponsors for this week, the good folks over at Wacom at WACOM.com, the makers of the Wacom One. And both Brad and I have in our studio use and love. And Bradley, uh, the Wacom One, how are you working with it lately? You know what I say about the Wacom One? One. What's that? It's always a Wacom One, except in this case, if you see somebody doing fantastic digital art, it's always a Wacom One. If you see somebody who's able to work on the fly and not be tied down to their studio, it's always a Wacom One. If you see somebody who's enjoying themselves with their art for the first time, maybe in a long time. 
it's always a Wacom one. I see what you did there, Brad. I, hey, I'm, nice I'm, not, the- I'm not immune to your charms. That was well done. Well done. And I hope <laughs> Wacom appreciates much. the charms of Bradley Geiger. <laughs> I As hope I say, nobody at Wacom is a Subaru uh, driver. <laughs> <laughs> you can check him out over at WACOM.com at Wacom.com. And Bradley J, we got a big show for this week and uh, a oh. lot of questions coming in. But uh, there's one that I want to lead off with for you. And it's uh, from uh, a good friend, Emily, over at Patreon.com slash Comic Lab. Emily yeah. writes, hello. Hello, Bradley and David. I feel like building tension in a story is critical to a good drama or suspenseful story. I can tell when a writer has done this well, but when it comes to me writing it, I don't know how to go about it. Is there a method? Are there tricks? Or is there just something I should pay attention to when I write? How do I add tension to a story or scene? Yeah. Well, this is great. Listen, this is something that I talk about in my storytelling class every semester. And and, and I could I could give you my whole lecture uh, about, you know, the three phases of narrative tension, anticipation, uncertainty and investment. Uh, but I've got I've actually got three different answers for you. And I, I think this stuff is a little bit more practical. And the first answer is uh, the one that you're not going to want to hear and the one you always uh, already kind of knew that the best way to do it is just to keep writing over and over and over and to read some of your old writing with narrative tension in mind and, uh, and, and look for the narrative tension. You know, once you, something that you've written has sat for long enough, you can read it again for the first time. Like yeah. you don't even remember what you wrote yep. and, uh, and read some of your old stuff and then take a look at it as an editor, instead of as a writer, if you had been handed this, with the assignment of how do I uh, make this uh, more tense? How do I increase the narrative tension? Uh, uh, That's a really good exercise. And then to apply what you learned to your next one. Uh, Also, here's my second answer is uh, look for low tension as you're kind of rereading your script. Look for the low tension and and that's where you can start to uh, improve. For example, low tension, uh, a few examples, dialogue with inane chit chat, meaningless conversation. Everything that happens, everything that's said should have a special purpose to move that story further. And it oh. should have uh, and, 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 and it, it should be obvious. Right. It shouldn't be, oh, this this person, what they're saying now uh, makes sense in a few chapters or something. A little bit of that is nice, but it goes a long way. Right. Right. You've got to have a sense of this uh, of this scene moving forward. And with every line of dialogue, every action that you're displaying in your comic has to mean something. Otherwise, you get this. And we've talked about that. Uh, a lot of what we're talking about kind of goes back to this idea we talk about every week on this show, which is something has to happen on your page. Right. That's that the very that's the very definition of low tension writing is if you've done like a whole page or a whole a uh, couple page spread and and you can't look at your reader in the eye and say this happened, a thing happened. This is important. Take a look at this. Um uh, Stuff that nothing happens uh, uh, is is really boring to write. Well, I'll jump in here real quick and say, uh, yeah, this is an excellent point about um, getting rid of meaningless chit chat or getting rid of filter of filler in the sense of uh, while you are focusing on building tension for the story. Remember that that chit chat can also, to Brad's point, be serving a purpose of building tension for the character within the story. So it's not just like, oh, the bomb is about to go off in the room next door. That's tension, obviously. But you can also have internal tension of like the character could be somehow expressing, no, I still had things left to do in life or no, I never got to resolve with my mother or no. I." What what I'm getting at is in in lieu of meaningless chit chat, find subtle ways of inserting meaning in there for the character so that they can be building tension in their own life while the overall situation is building as well. So yes, Brad, keep going. I'm sorry to interrupt yeah. you there. Here, here's another idea about low tension, inner dialogue that doesn't propel the story further, right? Those kind of you know, thought bubbles that don't mean anything, that don't, don't, that don't do something important in mm-hmm. that moment. They don't create conflict. They don't offer room for dissent. Uh, and here's, here's two more that I'll throw out there. That, that, that is, if this is happening, you know you've got low tension writing. Uh, creating an easy out for your protagonist. 
which is a bigger problem than a lot of us are willing to admit, because so many of us, especially right now, when the world seems like it's going upside down, we kind of feel bad for our protagonists. We just want to see somebody get through it easy. <laughs> you know, I just I just want to see you get to the other side of this, pal. And, and we may and sometimes we make it too easy on our protagonists. We're not willing to, like the old saying goes, chase him up a tree and then throw stones at them. Yeah. Right. We, 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 we don't really torture our protagonist enough. And, and really that, that final victory can't be sweet until you've ex- absolutely dragged that protagonist through the mud and, and beat them up uh, along the way. So taking it easy on your protagonist is low tension writing. And finally, info dumps. Nobody likes an info dump, right? When you just dump a oh. whole lot of backstory on your reader or you right. do a whole here's here's five pages of world building you'll need it at some point remember what i always tell you keep your readers on a need to know basis tell them what they need just before they uh, are going to have to know it uh that takes your keeps your writing a lot more tighter and helps to increase the tension but my favorite piece of advice that i give to my students every semester uh goes like this If you want to learn how to tell a good story, learn how to tell a good joke. Okay. Oh, yes, you're right. It's all there. It's all there. And I, and I mean it very, very seriously. And it's in terms of building tension and releasing. Yeah. Is that what you're getting at? Yeah. 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 Not just because I'm a humor nut, but because uh, it's, everything is there. The mechanics are there. It's a microcosm. Can I tell you, this is why Tina Fey can write drama but a drama writer can't necessarily write what Tina Fey can write. You know what I mean? Right. A good right. comedian writer can write anything they need because they they know how to do that tension and release uh, yes. that, that comedy requires. So yeah, keep going with this thought. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 if and I'm serious, it, it it is not the worst thing in the world for you to go out and learn a couple of jokes, not not knock knock jokes or like riddles. Hey, what did the you know what what do we what do you call an ex fly, Dave? What do you call an ex fly? An ex <laughs> a, a retired fly. Yeah. A flu. Uh, you, a flu. Okay. <laughs> you pitched that one before the show and I never thought I heard the punchline. I guess that was the punchline. <laughs> but yeah, not, not riddle jokes, but the jokes that require a little bit of a uh, buildup, you know, those, those old jokes, three people walk into a bar, bop, 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 bop. Uh, because in not only memorizing that joke, because to tell that joke, well, you've got to tell, you've got to keep your readers on a need to know basis. You've got to tell them what they need just as they need to know it. It right. can't be out of order. It can't be delivered too fast. It can't be delivered too slow. And I would absolutely suggest that you practice telling your friends jokes. And because it's also not only is it a microcosm of good writing, but when they laugh, it's positive reinforcement. You know, mm-hmm. you did it right. Mm-hmm. If they don't laugh, uh, maybe you need to keep working, right? <laughs> then it's a Dave uh, Kellett Saturday night. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Dave, Dave, Dave. Yes. Uh, one day Einstein has to go speak at, a, at an important scientific conference. On his mm-hmm. way there, he tells his driver that, uh, uh, notices, first of all, the driver looks a little bit like him. Uh, And then says, you know, I got to be honest with you. I'm sick of these conferences. Uh, It's always the same thing over and over. The driver says, you know what? You're right. As your driver, I attended all of them. And even though I don't know anything about science, I could give the conference in your place. Einstein says, that's a brilliant idea. Let's switch places. Right. So they switch clothes. And as soon as they arrive, the driver dressed as Einstein goes on stage and starts giving the usual speech while the real Einstein dressed as the driver sits in the front row. In the crowd, there's this one scientist who wants to impress everyone, thinks of a very difficult question to ask Einstein, hoping he won't be able to respond. So this guy stands up, interrupts the entire conference, posing this very difficult question. The whole room goes silent, holding their breath, waiting for the response. The driver at the podium looks him dead in the eye and says, sir, that's such a stupid question. I'm going to let my driver answer it. (laughs) <laughs> ah, i didn't see that twist that was well done nicely right? done yes so i mean so i i'm i'm serious it, it, learning jokes like that and 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 learning to tell jokes like that is is a great way to to learn good writing it's a microcosm of tension and release 
Right. And well, so let's break that down for a second. What did that joke yeah. do? It built a, it very quickly and and summarily uh, established where we were, established who the mm-hmm. characters are, um, gave a, a reason for being of why we're in the situation. I.e. Einstein is tired of it. The driver is excited to do something different. Yeah. Um, and then and uh, then the the final reveal is the twist that you didn't expect. I, I it's it's a delightful little microcosm yeah. of how to build up tension in a situation. It's great. And you'll find out if you do just a slight pause before that punchline to let that tension build just a little bit more, it, you get a bigger response too. That's why that's why you see every now and again in a humor comic somebody do what we call the penultimate silent panel. Mm-hmm. You know, you, have you ever done a penultimate oh, silent panel? I've done panel? my share. I've done my fair share. Yes. <laughs> that means that penultimate is obviously one before the last, and it just means before that last panel. You just, you draw, and usually a lot of times it's in a silhouette, you notice. Uh, They'll just draw that panel one more time with nothing happening. And it's just there to increase the tension a little bit in a a very short period uh, period of uh, time. And then boom, that last panel comes up and they, uh, and they release that punchline. And again, this works for humor, certainly. Uh, it works for drama too. It's all the same psychological mechanism. It, 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 it's it's all about building up that tension till the reveal. Yeah, Dave, and to, to achieve to achieve that beat, that that emotional yeah. beat that comedy has in a penultimate silent ca- panel, or as a stand-up comedian has with that hanging beat in the air where they don't say anything, right? Where the crowd and the comedian are waiting on it. How do you do that in drama, Brad? How do you how do you do the final is is that where you turn to interior monologue? Um, oh, you could right before uh, listen, the release. There's a hundred in- different ways you could do that. You can do that internal monologue. You can change the scene just very briefly. It look away <laughs> for oh, a second. Tolkien did that excellently. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Keep going. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, and you can you can have uh, you can switch the point of view for a moment instead of taking a look at from the protagonist. Switch it over to the antagonist for a second, or from a bystander. Right. It, it, there's a hundred different ways. The important thing is is that you give that just a little bit of space to move forward. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's the thing. It's just like Dave. There's these three couples trying to get married. Oh, for God's right? sake. <laughs> <laughs> you, this is such a delightful one. These three couples are trying to get married uh, at, at a Catholic church, a young couple, a middle-aged couple, and an elderly couple. Okay. And uh, by the way, that's another good storytelling. It's always the rule of three, right? Yeah. yeah. Two isn't enough. Four is often too many, unless you're going to go on to five, six, seven, eight, and make it ridiculous. There's something psychologically uh, satisfying about the rule of three. And, it, and again, it applies throughout. These three couples come up and the priest says, listen, if you're going to get married in my church, you must all go one month without having sex, says the priest. So he said they all agree. They all go back. They come back 30 days later. And the priest says to the elderly couple, were you able to go the entire month? And the elderly couple said, yes, we were able to do that. And he says to the middle aged couple, he says, were you able to go for the entire month without having sex? And they said, well, it was it was difficult, but we did it. We made it the whole month. And he looks at the young couple and he says, uh, how about you two? And the boyfriend says, nope, we couldn't do it. The priest says, why? Boyfriend says, well, my, my girlfriend had a can of corn and she accidentally dropped it. She bent over to pick it up and that's when it happened. And the priest said, you are not welcome in my church. He says, well, we're not welcome at the supermarket either. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm telling you. And, and by the way, they work at it, it, that one that would had sex in it, but it wasn't like uh, like explicit. There are dirty jokes. It also had canned whole... corn. So there you go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was a corny joke. But I'm <laughs> telling you, learn a few jokes, jokes that you can tell in, in, a, in a wide situation. I, it will improve your story writing. I, I swear by it, because, again, if you're thinking about it, if you're concentrating, it's a microcosm of good storytelling. I like this. Uh, so um, I, I, I think actually, Emily, the, the 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 entry advice that Brad said, which is more yeah. writing begets better writing mm-hmm. is, is also true. It's a, it's also an unhelpful piece of advice in the sense that we know that emotionally it, it doesn't make you feel great about things to say, well, time yeah. and tide yeah. will, will kind of fix this. But it, it's true. I am a better uh, a writer of tension now with Drive and I'm sure Brad with Evil Link than we were when we started. And some of that just mm-hmm. takes time and effort and seeing the results of your labors. Like you write it out, like you, Brad said, you let it sit and marinate. You go back to read it. And you're like, oh, I should have had a couple more pages of 
of uh, of a build here or or the release i could have handled a little bit better by yeah. by changing this dialogue around so um I, I do think between that and and practicing with humor and uh frankly watching uh some of the, your favorite movies in terms of of those tension moments where that that are released at the in the final third act there well we'll get you where you want to go all right well brad let's yeah. move into the uh the next question this is an interesting one and uh it's kind of a fun one to think about uh so this comes in from eric over at patreon.com slash comic lab and it says hi brad and Dave, I you get asked a lot of questions. You ask each other a lot of questions. What's the question each of you wishes someone would have just asked already since Comic Lab started? And then, oh. you know, what's the answer? But Brad, what is the question we wish someone would ask us? This is an interesting question. <laughs> I uh, It's interesting in the sense that I it's almost like uh, on some level it's almost like how would you summarize what you wished you could get across yeah. with the whole point of comic lab. You know what I mean? In yeah. one question yeah. is a, is a version of this, this inquiry. What do what do you think, Brad? What, what, what kind of question do you wish was asked? And it would, it would have to be something. Uh, see it. The, this is going to sound meaner than it is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. You'll have to just trust me. I don't mean this as snarky as it sounds. I, I want them to ask uh, who, not who, whose fault is it? Why, why is this going wrong? <laughs> I want him to ask. And, and the answer is nine chances out of 10, it's you. Oh, and now, before you get upset, before you get upset, here's what I mean. And, and this is, the, and, and I mean this from, with a friendship that I can't express. This is what I mean. Uh, so often when I see people uh, it, f struggling, and, and having a difficult time, whether it's, it's their art or their writing or their social media or any other thing, it's so often that they are looking for places to blame, right? We had that guy last week that was like, well, uh, it, it, social media just doesn't work for long form writing, right? right? And, right. and the answer is, yeah, if you're doing good social media, it does, <laughs> right? And, and so often it's so easy to look for outside reasons that something isn't working. And the actual, and, and it's much more difficult. It, it's much more uh, uh, hard to face. I know it's hard to face when I got to admit that I didn't hit the mark. Uh, it, it's so much harder to face. The answer, nine chances out of 10, is that it's something you are doing. It's not the algorithm. It's not the fact you didn't use the right hashtag. It's not any of this other stuff. It means you've got to get better. And until you really accept that part of this, that you need to improve and that chances are it's something that you need to work on. You're never going to find the answer. If you're, if you're always finding excuses in that algorithm over there and that hashtag over there, uh, I know it sounds mean, but I really want, I, I, I want the answer to be that you yourself have to take a, a, a look at what you're doing and look at how you can improve it. And then so many of those other things are going to fall into place. It's interesting. You and I, you and I are a lot alike in the sense that um, I was trying to formulate, as I was reading that question, sort of a, a, I was trying to reverse engineer a Jeopardy question, if you know what I mean, yeah. where Jeopardy yeah. takes a statement and then they make a question out of it kind of a thing. Uh, I was trying, the thing that I, as my summarizing thought for most comics careers, is that you have to make your own magic. Yeah. There is no there is no editor that's going to rise up out of the water and tap you on the shoulders with a magic sword. No. There's no publisher that's going to come along and change your career. There's no uh, one link that will bring 100,000 readers that will permanently yeah. stay if the work is no good. Uh, the, to Brad's point, there's no mash, magic hashtag. There's no there's yeah. no so, magic solution external to you working really hard for years on end. And uh, so Brad was saying, whose fault is it? My mind, my own construction of this was a little bit different, but it's kind of the same thing in that yeah. you are ultimately responsible for making your own magic. You yeah. are ultimately responsible for for investigating, learning about how to make this career, yes. you know, oh. not just passively receiving, but going out and researching. How are people making it work in small video game productions? How are small poets making it work online? How are people that are doing sculpture uh, and selling it online? How are they doing it? Learning from uh, keeping your head on a swivel and learning from all these different, um, you know, independent artists 
and then applying it to your own career. And mm -hmm. at the same time, applying all that stuff to your own art styles as well and, and, and learning and growing there. But that you ultimately have to make your own magic. There's not some yeah. external coming to it. So even though I, the, the downfall here is that I can't, I can't put this into a question that I wish people would ask. There's no real, yeah. I, I couldn't jeopardy it. But you get where I'm going with this is that you and I both had a flip side coin of the same answer, which is yeah. ultimately you are responsible. Yeah, it's it. This happens all the time. The topic of mentorship came up on Twitter just recently, and uh, I, 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 as you know, I do a certain number of consultations, and every now and again, uh, I'll take somebody aside and just like through Twitter DMs, just say, "Hey, I've got some thoughts uh, about what you're doing," and 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 if you want to listen to them, that's fine. If not, it's not a problem. Right. Uh, or somebody that I just I started working with in December. Uh, I checked in on them recently and they've quadrupled just about, I got to check. They had tripled their Patreon. They were very close to being able to say they quadrupled it. And when I said that uh, to a, to a person in a completely unrelated uh, conversation, uh, they said, well, what did you tell them? I said, I said the same thing I say on comic lab week after week after week it's the same thing i did there was nothing new i don't i don't hold back like the big there's, magic there's no hidden message people. that you only yeah. keep to the illuminati that's, uh, that that's the that's one of the most frustrating things about having done this podcast we're in our fifth year now about how, oh. doing it for four years plus uh is that uh, the people when you're listening, sometimes I think the people listening don't think that what we say applies to them or and this is a little bit more pointed. Don't take the time to say, how does that thing that Dave just say uh, or that thing that Dave just said, how does that apply to me? Right. Sometimes it might not be obvious. Sometimes you got to think that extra uh, length and say, how does this apply to me? You got to extrapolate it. Uh, but it, so much of it seems to go right past, go swimming right past you uh, because you think that maybe it doesn't apply to you. But I'm telling you, if, if there's one thing I could get across to you is that with very few exceptions, every last thing that we're saying on this show applies directly to you. There's no, and if you, and if you applied it, you could get the same kind of results. Yeah, no, you're, you're, you're hundred percent right. Um, so Eric, this is a fun question to ask Eric, because, um, I, I, maybe I'm, uh, maybe I internalized it in the wrong way in the sense that I, what I really want the, the unspoken question to be is how would you summarize your advice on Comic Lab? And yeah. maybe that's the wrong way to express that. But my heart tells me that that's the right way. That's the question I wish people would ask is like, yeah. what is the one crystallizing piece of advice uh, that you could give on Comic Lab? And for me, it would be, you've got to make your own magic. You've got to be responsible. Uh, and, and in doing so, you'll find a longer lasting, more stable uh, career that affords you a lifestyle that better fits with however you create and however you want to interact with your audience when yeah. you uh, when you own and control your own audience and when you make your own magic. So um, yeah. I, I think to Brad's point, it, uh, oh, go ahead, Brad, jump, you want to jump in? Yeah. And, and part of that, I just want to say, since since we, we did a real deep dive there and sometimes this is where the wheels come off the wagon again, <laughs> having done this for a while, I know this this next part, I got to say it. Uh, part of making your own magic means doing a good comic. All that other stuff that we're talking about doesn't matter beans unless you're doing a good comic. That's part of the magic. And listen, that it, it's going to be a little bit different thing for every person. There's no, I can't tell you uh, a mathematical formula for what that means to you, but I do mean that it's a, it's a, it's a big part of everything that we're talking about. First, the comic has to be really, really good. And chances are, if you're just starting out, you're probably not there yet. And that's OK. That's yeah. OK. <laughs> I'm telling you, I uh, do not uh, do not miss an opportunity to go and take a look at my first four and a half years of daily comics every day for four and a half years. Uh, there was a learning curve there and you can see it. <laughs> yeah, you can you, see a person that was learning to draw. He was learning to pace. He was learning to write a punchline. Uh, I, 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 I've got a, it, it's very easily found out there. <laughs> I, it, we all have to learn, right. And yeah. you're going to have to go on your curve as well. 
And that's why, uh, you know, a lot of questions we get are repeating a pattern of how do I jump out of the gate in a big way? You know, I, yeah. I only I only want to start if I can start with a splash. Right. And uh, and so a lot of our advice tends to default to a you're not going to start with a splash and that's OK. It's better to learn and grow and uh, along with your audience that it, that it's going yeah. to take time along with your burgeoning skills. Um, and so, uh, yeah, no, I 100 percent agree with you, Brad, that, that that's the right way to look at that. Hey, if you're listening while you work, take a minute to stand and stretch. And while you're doing that, we're going to tell you why you should join us on Patreon. When you do, you're going to get hours and hours of podcasts that we've recorded just for backers. And exclusive Patreon posts that go even deeper on Comic Lab topics. And access to our exclusive Discord server, which is a thriving community of professional cartoonists. So you can support the show you love and get tons of actionable resources for your own cartooning. And listen, if you can't swing a pledge this month, we get it. No worries. Yeah, yeah, listen, you can still support the show by rating us wherever you get your podcasts. Just leave a five-star review and a few kind words. That, along with mentions on social media, is incredibly helpful. Now, everybody, let's talk comics. Well, Brad, as we start the second half, the one thing I want to add on to our discussion from from what question we wish we were asked is, yeah, because I know that there will be a percentage of people, good people, good cartoonists that are listening to this and going, oh, I'm responsible. I'm the one making my own magic. So that means I'm a failure. And yeah. the, the second half that I want to add on to that is have the confidence to know that you will succeed with time and effort, yeah. right? It's that it's when we say you got to make your own magic and you are the one to be responsible. I can hear it already. Some yeah. people will internalize that as your failures are your own because you're a failure. Right. That's not what we're saying. What mm -hmm. we're saying is with a positive outlook and with optimism, face the future and keep working because you will get better. Your audience will get better and keep your head on a swivel and learn and grow as you go. And you will own and control your own career with time. It's about being truthful with yourself and being, and being realistic. It, it, it's, it's like that. Uh, I remember over, when I was over in uh, Los Angeles, you had that embroidered beach towel from Susan McTaggart <gasps> hanging out there by your pool. It you, was, it was the nicest you, thing. It, you tremendous thinker. <laughs> It was about truthfulness, wasn't it? it was it, did you did Susan McTaggart have? Yeah, any that's right. Susan McTaggart. Was... Uh, I, re <laughs> I remember <laughs> Susan McTaggart. Hello, friends. Susan McTaggart offering up my new book for Random House called "The Big Book of Love and How You Sit in It." Uh, oh. It's coming out in fall. Uh, my my friends, I want to leave you with one phrase for today, and that is, friends, the lies that we tell others are the truths that we tell ourselves. But when we tell others our truths, oh. Isn't that the greatest lie of all, friends? <laughs> oh, friends, Susan McTaggart, look for my new book in fall, coming from Random House. Love you so much. And Brad, since you were just a jerk to me, uh, I think you had a, that reminds me of your favorite Ziggy punchline that you had. Uh, Ziggy, I, well, I don't remember Ziggy. Is that a comic? It was a comic strip, Brad. Uh, uh, well, yeah, I guess I, I had, well, it was, it's, 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 it's sitting right up here. I had it framed just recently. I've got it right in it front framed. of me. That's and good. I had it framed. It said, uh, uh, yes, this is Ziggy. I finally asked that girl I liked if she'd like to go out, and she said yes. With who? This is Ziggy. <laughs> <laughs> what actually, you triggered my ass with it. My mom seized up on me. That was the most sad sack Ziggy you've ever done. I really appreciated it. You gave him kind of a lower lip thing, too. Yeah, the hand -hand was, mm -hmm. some, somewhere around Droopy Dog. Yeah, so you got a Droopy Dog. Is. That's right. That's right. Uh, uh, oh my God. I'm Ziggy. He's always your favorite around here. Mm, Ziggy. But I, but I do, before we, before we stop all over your very good point, that I, I do want to underline that if, if, if you're at your, we all started out not hitting the mark. We all started out yes. feeling like failures. We all started. And some of us still feel like failures from time to time. Uh, it, 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 if, if, if when Dave says you got to make your own magic and if you're sitting there looking at yourself saying there's, there's nothing magical about what's happening here. It's okay. That means you're on, you're on the process. You're doing the stuff. Uh, magic doesn't, doesn't happen overnight. Magic, magic takes a little while. If, if, if it, if it didn't take work, if it didn't take effort, it, it, it wouldn't be magic. That's right. 
That's right. That's right. Uh, and so uh, I, that's why I wanted to leave you guys with a positive note because I know, I yeah. know, I know, I know that there are going to be people out there that internalize that as a uh, negative. Like, yeah. well, then I guess that I'm the one failure out of a hundred. What you have to say is out of out of a group of 100 cartoonists, if someone says only one of you will succeed, you have to have the internal monologue of then, by God, that's going to be me. I'm the one that's going to yeah. do it because I'm going to put yeah. in the time and the work and I will get there. Um, anyway. All right, Brad, moving on to our next question over at Patreon.com slash Comic Lab. Yeah. This question comes in from Ray. And Ray says, I've loved hearing about all the specific tools and detailed frameworks Dave learned while at Mattel. But Brad... What tools, tips, tricks, or hints did you pick up as a newspaper graphic artist that helps you cartoon mm. today? For example, can you break down or walk through the method of quickly turning around news graphics to meet a deadline? I Ooh. feel it's a skill that also applies to cartooning. Yeah. Well, listen, you're, you're not wrong. I spent 20 years in newspapers where I was a deadline artist, and, 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 which meant making informational graphics on the fly a lot of times breaking news, uh, uh, that kind of thing. And you're right. There is a lot of it that I, I took out of that experience that I use every day in uh, cartooning, whether I want to admit it all the time or not, <laughs> because especially towards the end, I could not get out of that newsroom quickly enough. Uh, but one of them, as much as I hate to say it, uh, is, is the importance of editing. Uh, the importance yeah. of and and not editing like we typically talk about it, uh, where it's talking about story editing, uh, talking more about just nuts and bolts editing, spelling, grammar, stuff like that, stuff that I tend to be very weak on. Yeah, uh, I, I th th as as important as it is to know how to pace a joke uh, or any other type of writing, bad grammar, bad punctuation bad spelling can completely trip up your communication. You can literally have a readers. page of the work of Shakespeare, one of the great, yes. or, you know, Milton, whatever author you want to name, uh, uh, the most amazing passage. But if you have two misspellings, you will yeah. immediately lose 30% of your, of your audience. Cause they'll be like, ah, ah they misspelled yeah. the bourgeoisie. I can't take this. You know, whatever it is. <laughs> well, yeah, and, and punctuation. That's not how you spell heuristic. <laughs> <laughs> punctuation is a big one too because punctuation is all about getting that reader to read the sentence in the right way right whether it's a, a the difference between a comma and a long dash are completely different right a, a doubt down to quote marks and commas and all of that stuff uh it's really really important and learning how i i got so many of my graphics handed back to me by copy editors uh early in the day and of course uh, at that point in the process, it was all on paper. So I would have to manually make those fixes time and time and time again. Yeah. Over over the course of years, I started to learn English language and English grammar. Never did learn spelling, but, but I, I learned grammar and punctuation really, really well. I know what a split infinitive is, right? I, I, yeah. I didn't know that in 1991, what a split infinitive was. I, I split so many infinitives, I learned how to put them back together over time. <laughs> <laughs> You're over there doing particle <laughs> physics with all those split That's infinitives. Right. That's right. That's right. But that was the first thing is, is learned really the importance of using language well and, 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 and that down to punctuation and grammar. And the other one, especially being a deadline artist, I learned the importance of uh, what we, we talk about in art school all the time, which is perfect is the enemy of done. Yeah. When you're yeah. working on deadline uh, and, and at a newspaper uh, back in the day, if we went five minutes late, if I went five minutes late with my part of the job, then they were 10 minutes late getting that uh, off to the press. Then they were 15 minutes late getting the plates made. Then they were 20 minutes late getting it up on the press. If they if that happened right on down the line, getting them on the trucks and out there, you missed the morning commute. You were responsible for thousands, maybe even tens of thousands of dollars in lost revenue. Yeah. A point that management made very, very clear to us <laughs> on those times when we went late. Uh, it was in, it was inexcusable. So you learned very quickly when you're doing something. Uh, how can I get this done? And then once you get it done, how can I make it better in the time that I've got? Right. And then if you still have time, how can I polish it? Oh, and yeah. And then if you still yeah, yeah. have time, how can I nurture it? Right. You go you go up the lines. But the first job is to get it done. 
just yeah. get the job done. Especially it was it was very good being part of a team uh, because I would have to do a graphic that would have to be a certain size, certain uh, with certain depth. I couldn't go bigger. I had to shoot my mark. And if I didn't, then I wasn't part of the team for much longer. That was actually very good uh, lessons that I use in cartooning all the time. Well, I, I want to talk about this for a second, because this is actually really important for cartooning, which is that idea of finishing a thing, even if it's in a skeletonized, yeah. skeletonized form, and yeah. then bringing it to polishing and then nurturing and then increasingly beatifying it, you know, and making it all, all, all sorts of lovely with time. Because here's what I find for many illustrators who come to cartooning. They don't uh, take into account the repeatability of the process. So they'll start a 30 page story with a style that is too complicated, oh, too yeah. beautiful, too <laughs> invested with their skills, if you know what I mean. And they can't repeat the page to page. So what ends up happening, and you see this every once in a while, pages one through five are gorgeous. Oh, I know. Page five through 10, a little, a little, a little less, a little less gorgeous. <laughs> pages 20 to 25, oh, it's getting a little rough around here. And then pages 25 to 30 is just like um, stick drugs. You know, you're like, they've just given up. <clears throat> because one of the th one of the skill sets that cartoonists have that illustrators don't have is how to know what's good enough. You know, that, that that really the mind can invest a lot into a stick figure if you really had yeah. to, and then mm -hmm. to build up from there. Um, and so... I, I will spot, speak on Brad's behalf that that repeatability in newspapers and the daily deadlines directly yeah. translated into his first 10 years of cartooning because when you're doing a daily comic strip, it's all about repeatability and it's yeah. all about deadlines. We don't necessarily have that anymore so much. So I don't necessarily recommend that you have to do that to, in order to succeed with cartooning now, but it certainly helped him get his 10,000 hours in quicker with a repeatable... Yeah. Uh, a recurring deadline oriented comic strip that he was doing every day. Don't you think? Oh, absolutely. And I'll tell you, I'll, I'll tell on myself. Uh, I had one of those moments just uh, this past three weeks, I was finishing up the writing and, and, I, and, and it was really interesting. I had taken a couple weeks. I wasn't having like writer's block issues. The first, the A story fell right into place. It was like, Oh wow. I see exactly how this is going to work out. Beep, bop, boom. This is going to be fun. The B story, I had a little bit of trouble getting off the ground on. And, and basically part of it was I wanted this certain moment to happen. Like, you can't do that. He's the father, right? With something that I can make a big splash page out of. And I couldn't find any way to connect those dots. And finally, I'm like, what if I just tell the story? And then it was like, oh, yeah, that works out. Bing, bop, boom, I'm done. <laughs> so it came down to introducing a new character uh, who comes up as a figure from Lightning Lady's past. And I didn't know what I wanted to do for that character. I didn't know who I wanted to draw for that character. And I've got my sons are both old enough now that it's really fun to sit at the dinner table and say, I've got to come up with a character. Who do you who do you think? Uh, who do you think that character should be? You know, let's let, let's talk about this. They're both very creative in very different ways. And I got very different answers. Uh, but one of them, my son, my older son said, you should do an Android. You don't have an Android or a robot in Evil Inc. yet, and you oh, should. True. Yeah, you don't. And, yeah, and he's right. And he says, you love cassette punk so much, he should be a cassette punk robot. Now, just a little pause. You've heard of steampunk, right? You know what steampunk is. Yep. If, if cassette punk is taking that, uh, that, that technology from the 80s, cassette tapes, big clunky recorders. If you ever, those big computers, you know, the, that were connected to a mainframe. Can I pause you? Doesn't cassette, doesn't, uh, doesn't that broadly do post-war technology up to like the nineties, like from everything from the computer, the yep. everything from the fifties to the early computers in the nineties. And isn't that, and the that idea? would include like, like real, the real to real. real. Yeah. Cause it's, it's basically the, the design element of the Loki uh, art, art sets and stuff. Yes! Right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I loved Loki for his cassette phone so much. Yeah. And if you've ever seen the animated series, Archer, Archer was very oh, cassette yeah. Yeah, punk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. loved it for that. Uh, if any, that's the one thing. If anybody from Archer, uh, that 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 creative team ever wanted to do Evil Inc., I would give it to them with a blank slate. I'd just do everything you did for Archer with that, and I'd <laughs> well, be happy. We, I know this for a fact that we have a listener of Comic Lab that was a storyboard artist on Archer, by the way. Oh, is that right? Yeah, I I'll didn't know I'll that. tell you later who was. <laughs> tell uh, me who it is. Uh, but uh, be that as it may, he goes, you should do a cassette punk uh, 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 robot. I love the idea, but I had already written uh, two weeks. Uh, I had to get going. My yeah. deadline yeah, was yeah, looming. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And to 
to design a cassette punk robot was going to take some time. And with the amount of detail that that would include and being able to draw this character from all sides, the amount of detail that that would include would be very difficult to pull off day after day. Uh, The other idea was a Minotaur. Guess which one I went with? (laughs) I'm laughing. I've got that robot in my back pocket for another day. I'm not going to not do the robot. And, and, and but I'm uh, laughing but at the utility of this. Guess moment, which yeah. one I did. Looks like a Minotaur is <laughs> appearing for the next four weeks at Evil League. You better believe it. Well, not only that, but the B story I hadn't fully written out, but I realized very quickly as soon as I went to name him that if I ever get stuck writing this Minotaur, uh, well, first of all, his name is Angus. It, it, it could have been Chuck. Angus, it, it could have been Chuck. You named the Minotaur, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, Brad Geiger. Brad Geiger but naming the Minotaur. Sudden, and and he's a big beefcake character. All of a sudden, I realized that all of the cow jokes, all of the beef <laughs> jokes, all of these jokes about burgers, and so it was. Anytime I got stuck, I was going to have a punchline with just him standing there. And so I'm like, I can't not do that. And I know that that's going to grease the skids as I'm going forward. The the robot's going to show up at some point. Sure. But until then, I went with the Minotaur. Well, let me universalize this for a minute because. Two things that Brad just uh, mentioned are directly related to what he learned from newspapers. One is repeatability. Now, I'm laughing because Mm -hmm. I have also made decisions like that. We're like, oh, yeah, sure. A full space battle with 400 ships sure would be pretty. I bet a close up shot with three ships would be just as good. (laughs) And so we're doing the close up shot. Right. Uh, So I I, I jokingly understand the utility of that. Uh, But here's the thing. That's a lesson from newspapers, which is repeatability yeah. is important. If, yeah. if the quality of that Android would have really dropped down within three weeks or, oh. or slowed the whole process, then you kind of defeat the purpose of, of their introduction to the story. So then the second thing is that one of the things that uh, newspapers taught Brad, which is what you just saw happen kind of in real time there, which is just make the choice, make a choice yeah. because whichever yeah. way you go, you can, as a writer, make it work. You know, he could have made the Android joke work because then it would have mm-hmm. been a bunch of toaster jokes or a bunch of this or that. Right. Right. But now he's got Angus jokes and beef jokes and cow jokes. But the the simple truth is when you have, a, when you come out of a deadline environment with both Brad and I did, you yeah. realize that some choices just, you just had to pick a road, pick a lane. Yeah. And then yeah. your writer and creativity uh, uh, skills will come into, into bear and you'll be able to make it work basically. Absolutely. So, That's what I told that Subaru driver. I said, pick a lane. Get over there, you Subaru. <laughs> well, Dave, we've got time for another Patreon question. I'm going to pitch this one at you. This one comes in t- uh, from Leanne who says, hi, dad and brave. Uh, Oh, this is a great question, Dave. I'm at the very start of my comics career. Having written and rewritten for well over a year, I'm about ready to start releasing my first pages. However, at the same time, I have gained some financial success doing art commissions. I often feel guilty working on my comic when I have commissions waiting. Any tips you have on how to balance this would be very welcome. Oh. Thanks for the laughs and the learns, Leander. Well, uh, this is a fun one because it lets us talk about the sort of uh, kind of a work-life balance for an artist. And by that, I, I don't mean work-life in the sense of balancing your family or personal life. I mean, work as in the work you really wish you could be doing right now versus yeah. sometimes Uh, I need to pay for my life. And so I have to do uh, this project. (laughs) Right. And this is a unique situation because you have not actually started the comic yet. If I read that answer correctly, Brad, right. Is that how you read that? It's not Uh, actually out. By now they may have started because this question wasn't just from this month, but, but we're at the very beginning. I mean, I suppose the better way to do this is to answer for both scenarios. You already got your comic launch, but you need to take some commission work and you don't have a comic launch. Uh, One of the sort of underpinnings, that I have for my own uh, cartooning career is the sort of live to fight another day aspect of things, which is make sure you are paying for your life uh, before you do your cartooning. Uh, Mm -hmm. The the, the sort of the artist that you truly want to be, the art that you truly want to create, all that sort of stuff. It's sort of Laszlo's hierarchy of needs 
which is make sure you're paying for that rent. Make sure you're yeah. paying for those groceries. Make sure you got mm-hmm. a little bit of uh, money socked away for emergencies. Then you can then you can take the non-paying cartoon work that that is your true passion, right? And that's why for me, in my developmental years, I was doing nights and weekends because the mm-hmm. day job at Mattel mm-hmm. was the version of this commission work. It was paying the bills. And so yeah. I think without any huge hesitation, I would say go ahead and take the commission work. Just make yeah. sure you're not you're not giving up on the hope and dreams of, of the comic that you truly want to tell. Let that be your nights and weekends and lunch hour project. And mm-hmm. then uh, as you start to uh, develop it and bring it out into the world, hopefully the income from that builds up to the point where you can say, OK, now I would like to step away from some of this commission work. But maybe, Brad, you have a different way of looking at this. No. How would you look at it? Actually, I was going to I was going to say the same thing. You got to do the commissions. The commissions are bringing money in. Now, at, at some point, there's a couple of things I want to bring up, and, and that is find any way that you can to get as much bang for your buck on those commissions that that you might. In other words, you know, I use my commissions as exclusive oh, see, uh, yeah. Patreon content. So that's something or, or it, there might be some way, depending on the flexibility in the commissions that you can build those in to the comic that mm-hmm. you're doing, mm-hmm. right? If, if, if you've got that flexibility, but uh, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to agree with Dave. The commissions have to come first. Now, if you have so many commissions, if this is a quantity issue, you've got a lot of commissions built up. It sounds to me like you might want to experiment with bumping up the price on your commissions a little bit so that you can do fewer commissions and oh, make more money. Oh, that's an interesting thought. Yeah. And, okay. I, and I don't know for, I'm reading in between the lines that might be that that is the case, but it might be, if you've got a lot of commissions that are, that are stacked up, mm-hmm. you might be able to just tweak that price a little bit, bump it up a little bit. A couple of them are going to drop out and say, well, okay, that's, that's not, not what I wanted too rich for me, too much for my blood. Right. But a, a few of them are going to stay. And here's a spoiler alert. <laughs> Uh, once you start to increase your prices, you also increase the perceived value of what you're doing. All of That's a sudden, true. once you start saying that it's worth more, guess what? It's worth more, <laughs> right? And so a bunch of people are going to come in that, to replace those one or two that left because now they're getting something that's more valuable mm-hmm. where before they weren't getting a valuable thing. So don't be too scared. Remember, remember, you can always go back down. If, if you made a bad decision, you can always drop your prices and you can do it in sneaky ways. You can, you can, you can, you can make your price $200 a commission. And then if that ain't working, you can say next month, Hey, guess what guys, I'm doing a 50% off sale. Cause I love you so much. Right. <laughs> and now not only are you getting those commissions back, but you look like a real nice person. Cause you're doing 50% off prices there for you to play with it a little bit, especially when you're an independent publisher and an independent artist, that's something that you can do. So don't get too afraid of raising your price a little bit. You can always come back down and you can always uh, fix if you've got, if you made the wrong decision. Yes, I, I very much agree with this. And I, I think one, one other parting bit of advice I will give for this question, which is um, Just do make sure in a way that all of us have to do with day jobs or with any sort of income source, don't make sure that that income source uh, takes up so much of your time that it keeps you from ever during your week pursuing your dream of being a cartoonist. Just always make sure that you're carving out some time during the week, nights or weekends, where you can still do the work that you want to do. Um, because remember, the commission is not the end goal. The commission is just a stepping stone to keep you on the path of being a cartoonist. In the meantime, by the way, you're you're building skill sets. You're becoming more capable with uh, all your line work and your pen work and your brush work. So it's yep. it's putting in the hours. Actually, it's adding to your overall ten thousand hours. And that's why I'm saying you're you're living to fight another day in terms of getting your your true career. But just make sure that you're still pursuing that hoped and dreamed for project on the side, uh, uh, much the same way we would with a day job, because yep. uh, I don't want that to fall off of your radar. Absolutely. Dave, I've got, I think we can sneak in one more quick one. And I think we've got one that we might be able to handle a, in pretty good order here. This one comes in for our, uh, from our $5 Patreon backer. And it says, I've been experiencing a significant di- decline in patronage in spite of doing as much as I can to keep consistent, relevant, and engaging uh, posts on my Patreon. My question is, is there a level of support at which one might consider stopping 
and focus on other avenues and platforms to engage with an audience. Huge fan of your awesome show. Dave, let's give this person some advice. Okay. So uh, first of all, I think it is helpful to all acknowledge, myself included, that we have all experienced a sort of atrophying at times of our patronage audiences. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you couldn't go from, uh, from instead of 20 people, you have 18 people. Oh, look again, you have 16 people, oh, 14 people. And usually that tends to happen for me anyway, when I'm taking my eye off the ball, Brad, if you know what I mean, like I'm not yep. hugely yep. paying attention. And then three or four months go by and I check it. I'm like, oh boy, yikes, I lost some folks. I, <laughs> uh, uh, I, <laughs> yeah. uh, now what you want. Um, so I think it's worth admitting that even people that have been doing this for 20 years, you can have an atrophying of, of patronage. And remember, that's largely because it's perfectly fine that some folks need to go or want to go or have to go. Yep. Um, yep. If you have 900 backers, there's going to be a percentage for whom they've lost their job or there's a there's a health crisis in the family or yeah. they just had a, a certain number in their mind that they were willing to give and they reached that number. And now yes. they're parting ways. Right. All of that is fine. It's going to, you're going to have a rotating door of people coming in, people coming out. Usually what I have found when my audience size has atrophied is that the fault is mine, not because these people are leaving. As I said, all of those are natural and to be expected that they're going to mm -hmm. leave. The problem is mine because I wasn't out actively uh, encouraging new readers to try the comic and then yeah. the, encouraging the ones that have tried the comic with enough incentives to jump in on the Patreon. So the fault is mine, not my readership. And yeah. so usually when my, and, and listen, it could also be that uh, I'm not being as good a storyteller. That's also a possibility. I have to entertain mm -hmm. that. But in general, it's usually because I took my eye off the ball in terms of audience growth overall to the wider world and then patronage growth, growth from that audience to Patreon. Don't you think, Brad? I think you're absolutely right. I just have one thing to add to that, and that is sometimes it takes us a little while, especially in the beginning, to find the Patreon tiers that work best. And sometimes true, true, you yeah. just might be offering something that nobody wants or very few people want, right? And and you've got to give yourself the freedom to try out a new tier or to try out a new reward and, and to take a good look at the things that have low value for your audience and stuff that have higher value. If you get to that point, remember, you can grandfather out old tiers mm -hmm. without losing those people, right? It's called unpublishing a Patreon tier. And when, when you unpublish that tier, you keep everybody that's at that tier. You, you're going to want to send them a message saying they're not going to get that reward anymore. And they're going to want to adjust right. by either canceling their pledge or uh, moving to another uh, a reward tier. Uh, but it, this is something that you can try things out and say, here's something new I'm trying. And we're going to, and when you unpublish a tier again, you keep those people, but it disappears, uh, to anybody new that's coming in on Patreon where they're, they're like, they don't see that as an option anymore. It's disappeared. It's mm -hmm. still there. It's just hidden. Uh, that's how you can grandfather out an old tier and, and move in something that's working better. Listen, uh, Dave and I both tried, I, I, if we go went back and looked at what we were offering on Patreon when we started several years ago, oh, yeah, yeah. We, we, I've offered a lot of things that I don't offer anymore. A lot, I had a lot of uh, I, uh, uh, reward pitches that just was meant uh, with no real excitement. Right, I, right. You know, I, I, I had things that seemed like they were a good idea and then it petered out and I finally got rid of them. Some of them I, were illegal in four states. I remember that one thing you yeah, offered, Brad. That, that was... Uh, that, that, one, that one was surprisingly popular, but yes, I, I, I had to get rid of it. <laughs> Turned out the $5 level was very yeah. cheap for what I was offering. Po um, popular, popular, but I, I'd get so tired at the end. <laughs> Uh, but no, I mean, here's a, here's another way to look at this to, to build yeah. on what we've been saying is uh, as much as I said that a normal rotating door is possible, it's also possible to Brad's point that yeah. you uh, launched your Patreon with great fanfare. You got, I don't know, 100, 300 people to jump in. They're very excited. They're fans of your work, right? Yeah. They jumped in. But then over the first six months, they found that your Patreon might not actually be doing anything for them. And remember, yeah. a part of it is, is what does Patreon do for me? Well, it gets you access. It gets you behind the 
scenes. It gets you sneak peeks. It gets you exclusives, all that sort of stuff. And if you're not offering that on Patreon, if it's basically just a tip jar, you're going to find people drifting away, right? Yeah. And so that's worth looking at as well. Uh, not only the promotional stuff to the outside, but to Brad's point, am I offering tiers that work? Am I offering rewards that work? Um, yeah. Are my rewards uh, manageable for me in, in a way that I can do them on a frequent basis? Like Brad, in a way that I find superhuman has a, an incredible amount of extras that I would find exhausting to produce, but he does really, really well. And frankly, you should check out Brad's Patreon if, if no other reason, just to see how he does it. It's really, it's really smart how he does it. I'm, I'm continually impressed by what he's able to do with it. But um, to that point though, there is going to be a natural rotating door, but if you're finding a general exodus, and by that I mean dozens and dozens and dozens of people, then yeah. that is a problem probably with the way the Patreon structured as Brad was saying. Yeah. And, and listen, sometimes an exodus happens. I mean, you, there's just no getting around it. Sometimes an exodus happens. As a matter of fact, Dave and I are going to be exodusing ourselves right out of this podcast because we <laughs> find ourselves at the end of another amazing episode of the Comic Lab podcast. The show about making comics and making a living from comics. Your hosts have been my friend Brad Geiger, the editor of webcomics.com, leading everyone on their exodus, and the creator of Evil Inc. at evil-comic.com. And my good friend Dave Kellett, the co-director of the comics documentary Stripped and the cartoonist of Sheldon at sheldoncomics.com and Drive at drivecomic.com. And the Comic Lab theme song is used with permission from Andy Creighton at theworldrecord.net. And this episode was edited by Matt Woodard of Woodsong Productions over at www.woodsong.media. If you love Comic Lab, you can rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts. You may hear your review featured on a future episode. And Comic Lab is made possible by your support at patreon.com slash comic lab. So we'll go ahead and say that like a Subaru driver. Hey, Grand Rain! <laughs> You're in the Grand Rain! <laughs> friend susan mctaggart uh with the author of the new book of self-love dot 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 not that kind of self-love coming out from random house uh this fall with just a, a message just for subaru drivers just a little message just for subaru drivers friends friends if you're a subaru driver and you're waiting for a sign the sign is go go <laughs>